Welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to dominate your career, then you are in the right place. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker. And Monica Marquez, ex-Googler, diversity expert, and senior corporate leader. From inspiring stories to cutting-edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Nikki Barua, your host for today's episode. Have you ever struggled to get traction with some people where it feels like you're spinning your wheels and just can't connect with them? How do you get the results you want if you cannot influence or persuade them? In this episode, Dr. Nashida Dow Salheim shares actionable insights based on her unique and proven framework for creating the impact and influence you need in your daily life and work. Dr. Solheim is the author of the new book, The Leadership Pin Code. She has a fascinating background. She's a clinical and criminal forensic psychologist, a Harvard Law School educated negotiation expert, and a business leader and strategist. Dr. Solheim breaks down the art of persuasion, influence, and negotiation to a simple ABC strategy and explains exactly how you can use them to have the impact you want in everyday business situations. Visit imbeyondbarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources in this episode, including the best way to get in touch with Dr. Solheim. Hi, Nashita. So great to have you on the show. Thanks for joining us. It's so great to be with you, Nikki. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's jump right in and uh, tell our audience um, what your story is and what your journey has been all about and uh, what led to where you are today. So I guess it goes back to my decision to work as a psychologist. And many years ago, I trained as a clinical psychologist, Mm -hmm. really working with people with mental health, but I wanted to specialize in forensic psychology. So I was working after I finished my training with offenders who had committed very serious crimes. So they were housed in what we call maximum security hospitals. And the reason we call them hospitals is they were offenders who also had psychiatric problems. So Mm -hmm. they had committed serious crimes, but they also had mental health problems that either were part of the cause of how they'd come to commit their crimes, or perhaps the mental health problems really followed on from what they had done. But nevertheless, they were housed in these maximum security hospitals. And as a forensic clinical psychologist, I was working with two things. One was to understand what had led to them committing the kinds of crimes that they had. And we needed to have that understanding as psychologists because we wanted to work out whether factors in their lives, in their backgrounds, things that they had been exposed to, decisions they had made, that if we understood that better, we could perhaps prevent them from committing further crimes. Or indeed, we could go back and look at you know, how do we work with children when they're growing up or things that happen in our society that if we could address those might prevent other people from committing these kinds of crimes. So understanding was really one key aspect of what I worked with. And the second part of that was then really looking at assessing risk. Mm -hmm. So how could we try and understand the risk that this might happen again or to somebody else? Uh, certainly looking at uh, protecting society and and victims from from experiencing these terrible crimes. And in doing that, the skills that I was trained in was the art of building trust with somebody, a trusting relationship, albeit these people were, you know, offenders and they had committed terrible crimes that you would, you know, really make the hair on your, your neck stand. But at the same time, we needed to be able to build trusting relationships with them to get that information from them on what had happened and why they had chosen the path they had, uh, what had contributed to their offending, what contributes to the risk. And if you think about it, Nikki, these people were locked up in maximum security for a very long time, long sentences. So they weren't very motivated, should I say, for sitting with a psychologist and opening up and sharing their backstory and telling you what you needed to know so that you could make some kind of judgment about them or what they were likely to do next. But nevertheless, we were there to both motivate them to share that information and also meet our own need, which was to understand more. So the art of persuasive interviewing, of investigative 
active interviewing, of asking questions that help them to open up and communicating the win-win to them, really. You know, it's in their interest for us to understand them better so we can help them, we can rehabilitate them, we can, you know, offer them ideas and support for how they might live a different life. But at the same time, we were, the win for us was that in understanding that we could protect society, we could protect other people from experiencing the same things. So those skills really were the skills that I trained in and found really interesting, you know, how you can build a relationship with somebody you might not like or might ever have a relationship in any other aspect of your world, right? Mm -hmm. And how you build trust and, and you make that work so that you get, both of you get what you need out of it. And as I moved from working as a forensic clinical psychologist in maximum security, I moved into the Ministry of Defense in the UK. So now I was working with the military, whether that was Air Force, Navy, or the Army. And in that context, we were working with people who were returning from either war zones or peacekeeping. Back in that day, it was peacekeeping um, activities. And again, supporting people who had had very challenging experiences in their lives. In this case, it was a different context. This was not something they had invited or uh, necessarily done consciously themselves, but they were being exposed to terrible scenarios. And we were there to help receive them on their return. And we worked as clinical psychologists, of course, with things like post-traumatic stress disorder and helping them to integrate back into normal life. But once again, I found myself using similar skills. I was building trusting relationships with people who were traumatized and hurt um, and ha have them share information that was either painful, sometimes shameful or embarrassing with the purpose of, if I understand you, then I can help you. Mm. And if I can help you, then you have a better chance of being able to get back into living a normal, healthy life and mm -hmm. feel better about yourself. And the more I'm able to learn in my capacity as a psychologist, then I can both help you, but also work wider with the services in preventing this from happening, you know, preparing people for those engagements uh, in, a, in a better way so that they feel perhaps better able to cope with the situations they face. And we did a lot of that kind of training but also uh, helping this particular individual with their, with their concerns and their, their stresses. And so I started to feel that the skills I was learning was not really just about working with these particular groups. So now I could take what I'd learned as a clinical forensic psychologist and work with this group who were in, in very different contexts and experiences. And then I found myself working more with people who weren't necessarily Men, had mental health problems or very challenging experiences. But I was being asked to work more and more with people who were just curious as to how they could improve their situation, how they could, for example, achieve the goals they set for themselves in their career, or whether it was somebody who was trying to, uh, what we might call in, in loose terms, more personal coaching, really. You know, how can I have a better work-life balance? Um, how can I expand my skill set and, mm -hmm. and figure out what else I could also do with the, the skills I have today. And it took me into working with business. And I moved to Norway and started working uh, with oil and gas in particular and in leadership development. So mm -hmm. now I was working in, in a business context and I found myself drawing heavily on the clinical skills that I'd learned. So building trusting relationships, working with people, sometimes who were open to change, uh, maybe changing perhaps direction in the business or changing themselves in terms of I need to adapt to this new team that I'm leading or the conflict situation I'm facing and how can I build a relationship with those, those situations or those people so that I can have the effect I want to have. And what I found myself drawing on in coaching these leaders was the same skills, teaching them what I knew. So I was saying, okay, well, what I learned as a psychologist was these kinds of questions will really help you to open people up and have them want to speak to you and share with you and connect with you. And these kinds of responses will encourage people to follow you, to feel engaged by what you say. And of course, a lot of my clinical training focuses not just on what you say, but how you physically present, you know, your, your body language, the, the total communication you have. Mm -hmm. So I found myself more and more with leaders sharing the skills that I'd learned and realizing that they really had this generalizability. They were much more than mm -hmm. context-specific skills. So to answer your question, you know, what's my story and how did I get to where I am? I think my, my experiences as a psychologist in different settings taught me, I'd say three things. One is 
that in the end, it's about people and everybody is different and everybody has their own way of learning. And I had learned ways of tapping into everybody's individual motivation for what they wanted to get out of this conversation. And the second thing I learned was that what's in my mind, my agenda isn't enough. I have to understand what's in it for them. So mm. I'm only going to be able to get that cooperation if I really spend time understanding what's in it for the other person to have this conversation with me. And then thirdly, it really was important for me to understand that everybody has their own story. Mm. So everybody deserves a voice and they have a voice. And it's amazing what you'll learn in opening up and having that conversation. It might teach you something about yourself. It will certainly teach you something about them. But it might teach you something that you can then take on further on and use in another context or another setting. So that curiosity mm -hmm. of, well, what's in your story? I'd like to know. I think those are the three things that I really took with me and I still think I use today. What a fascinating journey. I'm, I'm fascinated especially by the through line in your story from going from criminals to the military to business leaders. <laughs> and of course, that sounds like a natural progression right there. I don't know what it says about business leaders, but... Um, I can tell you, when I tell, when I tell business leaders sometimes, you know, when I'm opening in presentations and, you know, I, I tell my story and I say, you know, I originally worked with psychopaths. You can see sometimes the, the color draining from their faces. Like, well, is that why you're here, Nashita? I'm like, no, you can relax. It's not why I'm here. But there is a common thread to the way I work. I'm not saying there's a common thread to the way you guys work. So well, I have to well, always make that, that clarification. What your story illustrates, though, is uh, the idea of competencies that are transferable. And um, so many people get caught up in their skill and experience in a certain context, a uh, certain industry right. or a certain job, and don't recognize that there's a greater degree of competency that you could transfer into an entirely different context and be able to switch lanes. And especially at a time like this, what we're going through right now in a pandemic and uh, economic crisis all throughout the world, a lot of people are struggling because um, they're concerned about, hey, this is the only job I've had or this is the only skill I've, got, uh, I've had and I just got laid off or I don't know if I can find something else. How do I transfer into something different? And what your story illustrates in addition to your expert negotiation skills and mm -hmm. your, um, you know, talent as a, as a persuasive influencer. Um, what it really highlights is that that is possible for anyone to be able to look at a bigger through line in their own capabilities and story that opens up entirely new opportunities. I love that you've really drawn that point out because that's something I find myself talking to when I'm, I'm working with clients, which is what are the skills you, you have that you can transfer to this situation from other situations? Because often when people come to me, they're coming with a challenge or they're wanting to address some kind of concern or it can be, for example, you know, a, a conflict or some kind of situation that they feel they don't know how to handle. I mean, that's why they tend to spar with coaches and advisors, right? So what I will often find we will do is say, well, where have you experienced this kind of feeling before? Mm -hmm. Or if it isn't the same situation where you have been able to overcome or you've been able to have impact or influence and where we're able to draw on other experiences where they can bring up those skills and say, okay, yes, that was perhaps in a different context completely. That was at home with my wife or my husband or that was with a good friend. But actually, it did work there. So what can I draw from that in this conversation with my employee or mm. with my stakeholder or with a, with a client? So I think it's a great point that we often get trapped in thinking that what we're doing at work has its own set of tools and its own set of frameworks mm -hmm. that we need to stick to. And I really think there's a lot more that we do in life that we can transfer into our work environment and vice versa. Absolutely. As well as our perspective of ourselves and how that gets shaped in terms of who we are and who we have the potential of becoming, you know, that journey of going from current state to that future state is truly a patchwork of experiences and our tool set that sometimes we're unaware of. 
Um, so I want to jump into uh, your book, The Leadership Pin Code. First of all, congratulations um, on launching the book. I'm uh, you know, very excited about sharing that with our audience today. So tell us um, more about the book. What are the core beliefs um, and messages that led to it? Uh, you shared a little bit about your uh, professional experience and the skills you've learned, but what, what is the big message um, that you want to share with the world through this book? Well, thank you for that, Nikki. I'm super excited to have finally got to uh, launching the book because it's something that came out of working with those skills I've just described and working with clients and then getting feedback that, you know, this is not as difficult as we thought and what you described is really helpful. So, you know, how can we go back to it and look it up? So I, that's where the book really came in. But what the book is really about is stripping it back and getting to the essence of what I think leaders could do to have the kind of impact they want to have. And oftentimes it, leaders will say to me, and employees too, but leaders in particular will say, you know, I'm often misunderstood and misinterpreted. I intended to be really supportive, but they experienced me as controlling or I was trying to be really helpful and they said I was micromanaging. Mm -hmm. And this gap between their intention and their impact was something that they were confused by and often felt misunderstood. And when I look into those gaps with, with, with them, I could see that perhaps what they were missing was the how. How do I translate my intention into the kind of impact I want to have? And as a psychologist and working with, with all those different kinds of groups that I'd worked with before, I, I was thinking, well, there are two things really I want people to understand. One is it's not as difficult as it looks when you see, you know, films and you see these people making it, you know, negotiation look very complicated and, and glamorous and difficult. Uh, of course, it's, it's done the, deliberately that way in, in films to, to have that kind of impact. But if Not you, everything has to be a hostage situation. It, exactly. <laughs> Thankfully, it isn't. <laughs> Asking um, for, a, you know, a pay raise doesn't have to be exactly negotiated. Really, I wouldn't advise using it as a hostage <laughs> situation. Absolutely. I think that's a great point. So what I wanted to do is demystify it. So the book is really about giving leaders... The really just three things that I think make a difference to that gap between what you intend and the impact you're trying to have. Mm -hmm. And I know because I've practiced it over and over myself and with other people that if you just do one of these things in each of those three keys, it will make a difference. So I talk about the three keys relating to the skills of pers being persuasive, having influence and negotiating, but breaking it down into this simple ABC. And that's where I really want people to grab and take with them is that it really is as simple as ABC, having that impact that you want to have, just being 1% better. So the A is what I call your advanced preparation or your approach. So mm -hmm. before you start going into a room and speaking to somebody, you start having that conversation, you have that meeting, you do your advanced preparation. Mm -hmm. And it really is, eight, you know, let's put a number on it. Let's say 80%. I don't know. There's no science to tell me that that's true. But it's at least the majority mm -hmm. of the success you're going to have is going to be in the A, in your advanced preparation. And what I mean in, by that is it's what you need to know about the other person you're going to have the conversation with. How much research have you done to really understand what they're interested in? Mm -hmm. What's going to motivate them to have this conversation with you? What are their priorities right now? What are their concerns? If you don't manage to hook into what's on their plate, what's in their head, what's bothering them or engaging them right now, and you come along with a request for support or for help or something you want to tell them, then it's not going to meet them where they are and they're going to be less motivated to join you. So the first rule I always say is figure out what's in it for them. Get out of your head and get into theirs. And then the second part is think about your body language. So the B in ABC is behavior. Mm -hmm. So your body language behavior, think about having open body language when you're communicating with people. And you know what is open body language? It's about not folding your arms. It's about not having a furrowed brow. It's not looking mm -hmm. irritated when you're trying to communicate that you want help or support. So mm -hmm. that your body language is in concert with the message that you're giving mm -hmm. and to be very conscious about that. And the other part of behavior I talk about is the room behavior. And what I mean by that is, have you thought really about where you're going to sit in the room, whether you should have a table? Should you sit directly opposite each other at that table with very direct eye contact? Would it be easier if you sat in a V or the 90 degree seating, which is a little softer and allows for more natural eye contact and gives you that feeling of us 
being in something together rather than being on opposite sides of the table, quite literally. Have you thought about whether you need a PowerPoint? Um, would this be a conversation that's better had as a walk and talk? Should mm -hmm. I really be thinking about having lots of paper in front of me piled up as I'm having this conversation or a PC open? So the behavior of the room will have a significant impact on how the conversation you're going to have is going to go and how it's going to feel for, for the other person. So being conscious about letting the room also facilitate an influential conversation, mm -hmm. removing barriers, removing obstacles, removing formalities, if what you're trying to achieve is a cooperative conversation with somebody. And then the C in the ABC is your conversation. So mm -hmm. you've prepared well, you've understood what this person or these people want out of the situation that you want to uh, meet them in. You're thinking about how am I going to present, showing up with positive body language and even thought about how I'll set up the room. And then it comes to the more tricky part, which is what do I say? Mm. So how, and this is a bit I think, Nikki, a lot of people ch are challenged with, which is how do I start the conversation or do I even start the conversation? And what kind of questions can I use that will keep this conversation positive and engaging and open? And if they show up with, you know, strong emotions, maybe they resist an offer on the table or they push back to the change that I'm asking them to follow me on, or they don't want to engage in this particular task, how am I going to prepare to respond to that in a way that keeps us in a collaborative dialogue mm -hmm. so that I don't get defensive and, and start getting into the same mode with them, right? So the ABC, what I really want people to take away is in my book and in the way that I work, if you just address the ABC, take one technique out of each of those and just try them out. They're very practical. They're very doable. You don't need to be a psychologist to try them. Then I really do think you will see an impact straight away. And I'll just to, to prove the point, one of the things that happens to me now after I finished coaching people is I'll walk into a follow-up meeting with them and I'll see that they've arranged the chairs <laughs> just the way we discussed it. And it's, it's, it's the immediate thing that they'll tell me they did straight away. And I, I think it's great because it was a tangible, easy mm -hmm. fix. And they'll tell me that it's had a huge impact on the kinds of conversations they're having. And it was as simple as where you put your chairs. I love so, the practicality yeah. of all of the recommendations, but how powerful the framework is, um, you know, the ABC steps to have, uh, you know, uh, more persuasion, influence, and better negotiation. I think it's uh, not only a key thing for leaders, but uh, for everyone in general, we go through our lives um, having influence or no influence and being right. able to persuade or not be able to persuade and uh, negotiate the things that are important to us in a way that, um, makes us feel good. So um, I, I'm really excited about the impact you're going to have through uh, the book and sharing this framework. Um, I'm curious, uh, I want to share with you two scenarios and I'd love to get your um, takeaway and tips on exactly how you would apply your framework in these two scenarios. First of all, out of sheer curiosity, how would that work when you're faced with a psychopath criminal. <laughs> I mean, I'm just so curious, how does one even fit across or, or however you handle that conversation? You know, take us back to your former life and you know, one of the worst you know, uh, you know, criminals that you might have encountered. Tell us what that was like using that framework and then in a completely different context, let's talk about what it's like for someone who is um, uh, interviewing for a job or asking for a promotion. So let me take you back to really the framework. You're right. It does really come from crystallizing those skills that I used way back as a psychologist in those settings. But, you know. You and know, I'm only asking because I want to be prepared if I ever encounter that situation. <laughs> <laughs> let's hope you never have to use the skills in that context. But let's, let's talk about it in case that ever happens. Um, but I was in a maximum security environment. And so there were, you know, Offenders that we, or patients we call them because they were in a hospital setting with mental health problems, they were locked in locked environments. And we would meet them as on a one-to-one -one as psychologists because you, it's very hard to build a relationship with somebody where you're going to get into, you know, often quite traumatic histories and stories uh, of what they've been through with an audience, you know, kind of on the ward with 15 other people hanging around. So we would go into a room. Now imagine that these are very dangerous offenders who could be uh, at risk of becoming very violent or mentally disturbed. Uh, so you needed to keep yourself safe. 
uh, going into the room on a one-to-one. -one. And there were always other stuff on the wall that you could call on. There was always a button on the wall that you could press for assistance if anything should happen. But we would really prepare before we went into the room. We knew the patient as much as we could. We would have spoken to other staff and assessed their mental state during the day the day we were going to have the meeting would never walk into a room unprepared, not knowing how, what kind of morning they'd had, you know, had they taken their medication? Were they in a good frame of mind? Had they had any bad news and how prepared were they for this conversation that we're coming along? Do they understand the purpose? So we would really do our homework mm -hmm. and we would already have prepared uh, and very much part of our training. So when you go into the room, do you know where you're going to have your chair in the position that allows you to exit the room easily mm -hmm. from a safety perspective? So you would never put your chair in a corner where you would have to go around this patient to get to the exit if you needed to leave quickly. And the room would always be free of objects that could be, you know, used as, as weapons, weapons yeah. or, or, you know, you could hurt them. They could hurt themselves or they could hurt you. with. And so you would be very conscious going into the physical room of where you're sitting, you know, and I think that's probably where my tips come from is that I was always very aware of my physical environment in those settings, but where to sit and how to create a collaborative. Uh, I wanted these people to feel comfortable with me. So I would try and create a collaborative seating arrangement. And then in terms of my body language, I really wanted to communicate that I was trustworthy mm -hmm. because I was wearing keys that locked the door that allowed me to move into freedom, but didn't allow these patients out of their their locked environment so you were always going to be seen initially as somebody not to be trusted because you had power so it was really incumbent on us to try and communicate trust in other ways and to compensate for the fact that we had this authority and power and so we would use our body language we knew how to communicate empathy genuine empathy we did feel empathy for their situation knowing their backstories and and trying to understand I'm not saying sympathy, which is very different. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that we understood and agreed with what they had done, but we could empathize with the pathways that had led them to offending and understanding those pathways. So we wanted to communicate that through our body language, which I talk about in the book about how to communicate empathy through your physical demeanor and how to then build trust through the conversation. So where do you start? You know, you wouldn't jump straight into, so, you know, what took you into making that decision that led you to doing that? You know, what were you thinking was not the best way to start the conversation. Mm -hmm. So we knew how, and were trained in that conversational style to start with just understanding and empathic statements and listening. What Asking might be questions. the very first so thing? The very first thing, okay, if I'm meeting somebody for the first time, I would say, so um, why don't you tell me about how you feel about meeting me today? Mm. You know, where are you right now? Because I want to know whether you're feeling comfortable or stressed. And let me, let's address that first. And let's, what it's also a very neutral have? topic that doesn't. Very get... neutral. And what questions do you have about why I'm here and what you think I'm here to do? So let's get our expectations clear. Mm. And I do that still when I'm coaching, you know, why am I here for you? And what do you want from me? And what are our expectations of each other in this process? Before I then go on to, so tell me your story. Mm -hmm. because often, well, oftentimes people will start with a story mm -hmm. and we haven't yet developed the trust. We haven't figured out, you know, do I like you? Do I trust you? Mm -hmm. um, am, I, am I comfortable sharing what might be quite uncomfortable feelings and experiences mm -hmm. with you? So starting in a, always start with curiosity. That's my tip. And be genuinely curious. Be really interested in the other person's story without any gain for yourself at that time. Mm. So yes. that's my psychopath experience um, yep. story. Okay, so now let's cases. translate that to a <laughs> okay. scenario where um, I'm perhaps um, interviewing for a job that I really, really want. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, but I want the right title. I want um, the right kind of paycheck to come with it. I have a lot of anxiety built up around, will I get what I want? Uh, I have no idea how to read the other side. Um, as well as, you know, potentially just an important um, work conversation. Maybe it's a difficult mm -hmm. conversation or mm -hmm. maybe it's um, asking for that promotion or raise that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've been desperate for, but I don't quite know how to bring it up. Hmm. How would um, that scenario play out? So I love this one because this comes up in all kinds of contexts, whether it's your first ever job, whether it's a promotion within your existing company, or whether it's about asking for a pay rise. And the principle is the same regardless of the scenario, which is 
typically the mistake most people will make is it'll, they'll start with their own agenda. You know, I, what I need from, they'll be thinking, what I need from this conversation is, what I need from this meeting or this interview is, and they will get so caught up in that internal dialogue of what I need is, that that will then manifest itself in the questions that come, or the statements that come out of their mouths as they enter the meeting or they start the conversation. And that sets itself up for a, a one-sided dialogue, which is I'm here and this is what I need. And the other person isn't feeling very motivated to, to join you in this conversation because they don't really see what's in it for them. Right. And now, that's you, what breaks the first rule, the what's in and it. And that breaks the rules. Exactly. So I always say to people, before you go into any meeting where you're looking to gain something, whether it's a job or a promotion or, or an increase in salary, do your homework, do your A. Who's sitting on the other side of the table? How well do they know you? What do you know about them? Do you know what would motivate them to give you this opportunity? Um, do you know what their key priorities are? So let's say, let's concretize the scenario. Let's say you're going into a, an interview. You really want the job and the title. You think you have the skill set, otherwise you wouldn't have applied. And you think they should hire you because mm -hmm. naturally you think you're good at what you do. So that should be enough, right? But actually, if you don't do your homework and figure out, so what's in it for them to pick me over and above somebody else? Mm -hmm. What is it that I can appeal to in their interests? Mm -hmm. So let's say they're particularly interested in hiring people who have had diverse experiences of working in different types of settings, and you happen to have that. Mm -hmm. Compared to maybe you think your, your competitors in this process might be people with deep technical experience in one area. Mm -hmm. So you've done your homework and you know that that's what your interviewers are, are, will find appealing and are going to be interested in. So you're going to try and hook your message onto that. So instead of starting with the mistake, I call it, of what I need is you, you will start to appeal to what I understand. Let me check that I understand your situation. Mm -hmm. So the company today, you know, is working with these priorities. And it, can I check out that my understanding is correct? which is that you're looking for people with diverse backgrounds so that they are more adaptable and flexible. And I think what I can bring to the table is, mm -hmm. and then you hook your, your abilities, your skill set, onto their needs. So they see you as relevant mm -hmm. to their context. Let's and that really the, is something that's missing, I think, in a lot of people's attempts to try and get onto, onto a ladder. That's excellent, uh, especially the idea of framing the conversation again and, and starting with a neutral place and then appealing right. to their interests and positioning yourself as the solution to that particular goal or challenge. There you uh, go. Let's talk about the, the room setting. You know, you talked right. about obviously in a prison cell, you're looking for safety and escape. Mm. <laughs> How would that work in an interview or maybe just a conversation with your boss? So if it's a conversation with your boss, you know each other. Um, and I would really, if I was the boss uh, or speaking to the boss, I would have them, if they were initiating the meeting, absolutely have them find a V-shaped solution to the seating. You know, going into a room and having a small round coffee table, if you need a coffee table at all, um, and having the seats arranged in a V or at 90 degrees. Uh, that absolutely makes it feel as though you're in a conversation together where the table represents the task that you're trying to solve that sits ah. between you, right? So that's the, that's the unconscious. So as opposed to being on opposite sides of the table, right. there's a natural sort of uh, conflict um, positioning. You're it is. looking it's, at and, the table as the objective and being on the and side. What happens to eye contact, Nikki, in that scenario where you're sitting opposite sides of the table is the eye contact is very direct. It's very hard to look away from each other. And yeah. you can try this at home. Um, just sit across the dining table. And if you have very, what I call 180 degree seating, your eye contact is much more direct and it's hard to glance away. So that yeah. works okay when you're intimate with somebody and you know them very well. But in a work environment, that can feel too intense. Mm. Whereas if you sit at the corner of a table, and this is my tip for dating, by the way, if anybody goes on a date, please have the tables arranged on the 90 degree because it's a much nicer angle for having natural eye contact than oh. seating strangers across the table at 180 degrees, just from a generalizability of the skills perspective. Right. But the idea that you're seated at 90 degrees means that your eye contact isn't forced directly onto each other. You can glance mm. easily sideways and away again. Of course, you don't want to sit right up next to each other because you have to turn your entire body to face each other to speak. 
-hmm. So it really is more natural on the V or on the 90 degrees. And so if you are the employee and not the leader and you didn't get to choose the setting of the meeting and you walk in and you find that your boss is seated at one end of a table, so take the chair and go sit at the corner next to them. Mm. Force the chair into a V. Um, or if there's a possibility of getting into the room first, arrange it so that it creates the V opportunity for your leader to walk into. But it will immediately change the feel uh, of the conversation. And you just have to try it to really see that what I'm saying has an effect mm. because I was in a meeting actually with a, a new client a, a few weeks ago and she commented on this afterwards because she saw me coming into the room and she was a, a, a talent trainee who had come into the room to talk to me about her new role and to talk about whether she was going to have coaching. And I saw that she was seated across a huge boardroom table. We'd been booked into one of these, you know, huge tables with seating for about 14 people, I think. And she sat on one side and she'd put my coffee cup that she'd very nicely got for me and a, and a glass of water on the opposite side of the table to her. So the signal was for me that I would sit opposite her. And of course, I picked it up and I moved around. I said, was it okay if we just sit a bit closer together? I think it would feel much nicer to talk to you and sit a bit closer Mm -hmm. on the other side table. And she was surprised and smiled, but taken aback. And she commented on it a couple of meetings later and said, it changed everything for me. Instead Mm -hmm. of feeling I was going to be interviewed by you or I felt that there was going to be a formal process, Mm -hmm. I just felt it it was just nice to talk to you. And that's what we want to create. That's the feeling we want to create when we're in work environments, talking with our leaders or we're leaders are talking with employees. So that's what I would recommend. Thank you. That's, that's a great tip um, and certainly something that's very practical for um, our audience and a scenario that so many of us run into and often don't put ourselves in a position of um, you know, success, uh, just being able to set ourselves up for success. Um, The other thing I'm taking away is between the A, B, C's, um, it's um, if you do the A's and the B's correctly, the C not only becomes easier, but is frankly a a much smaller portion of the overall pie in terms of a winning combination. So much of what I'm saying is about the A of, you know, your preparation plays a big, big role in all of that. And you can actually plan your C. So if you know you're going into a, uh, an interview for a job or if you're going into a conflict conversation or to resolve a conflict, then you will prepare your questions ahead of time. And that's what makes it easier. Mm-hmm. And in, in the book, I actually give away some of my tips as a psychologist, questions I was trained to use. Mm-hmm. So they're in there. Not all of them, obviously. The book would be very long, but I've given <laughs> some tips for some of the common scenarios that leaders will face and, and questions to try and use that will open up, that will set the scene for a collaborative conversation Mm -hmm. instead of starting from a point of being in your own head or getting deep into details that are going to create conflict conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm curious about an entirely different take on especially the room setting part. Um, And I bring this up because this is a common challenge that women face in the workplace, which is you have a team meeting, um, you're going into the conference room, there's a large group of people there. And um, unless you're very confident, you will not take the uh, seating at the head of the table or up front, you might take the one furthest away from um, the head of the table and perhaps not be very expressive and um, almost blend into the background. And that is a huge disservice to the contribution and perspective you can bring in that. Um, How can someone overcome that kind of situation? And and what would your advice be to go from being completely blended with the furniture to, you know, maybe putting yourself in a, in a better position? So I could write a whole book just on this itself because there is so many nuances to context that we need to take into account, but let's take, the most common scenario that you're entering a meeting with people that you know, but you maybe don't work with every day. And it's dominantly men. And women will often, when I'm coaching them, come with this scenario of, you know, I I don't want to speak up. I don't want to offer an opinion. I stayed quiet. Um, I waited until everybody else had expressed theirs first. And then it didn't feel like it was the right time to say anything, or I felt like I would be jumping out and suddenly saying something. So I decided not to after all. Mm -hmm. And, One of the things that I find, well, 
maybe I'll just run through three or four things that I find that show up for women that get in their way in these scenarios. The first one is the fear of not being able to say something coherent and perfectly enough. Mm-hmm. If I'm going to speak, it had better be good and it had better be perfect and it had better be meaningful and it better really make a difference. Mm-hmm. And if they were to look around the table and see how many of the other people in the room had said something that standard. <laughs> coherent and met that standard, they, they would let themselves off the hook and speak. But they get into this idea that they need to be better than everybody else. So they get into this comparative mindset. And this is the biggest hurdle they have. They are comparing themselves all the time to a lot of other people in the room and deciding as a result of that, that they either don't know enough or they shouldn't take as much space as these other people or they don't have the, they're not entitled to have the same right to a voice. And that can get in the way. And I, what I really encourage them to do is in the A, in the mindset, is let go of comparative statements mm. and get away from comparing yourself to anybody else in the room. Nobody is the same as you and you don't need to be the same. In fact, what you bring is a diverse opinion. You bring your own story, you bring your own experience. So you have an equal right to be in the room and an equal right to have a voice. Mm. And so that's the first thing, which is address your mindset about being good enough or being allowed to have a voice or a space at the table. The second thing that I find women do is if they decide to enter the room, they will do as you described, try and be a wall, wallflower or, or blend into the background. And what that does is, whether that's the way you've chosen to dress so that you try and stay neutral in the background, nothing too bold, nothing too bright, or you try and dress in a, what is known to be a typically masculine style so that you feel you blend in with everybody else, that will show up in the way you feel and what you then communicate. So it'll have one of two effects. You'll either, because you've tried to blend in and disappear, stay quiet and not offer an opinion because you came with that mm-hmm. mindset in the way you chose to dress and where you chose to sit away from the main decision makers in a corner of the room. So you're already signaling to yourself and everybody else, I don't really deserve to be here and I don't have an opinion. So then you shouldn't be surprised that you don't contribute Mm -hmm. because you've set yourself up for that, that role. Or they do the opposite, which is I will suit up. I'll come in, I'll take a seat near the decision makers. Mm -hmm. And what I have to do is be as, as maybe as aggressive or as bold or as, as direct as the most extreme other person in the room as though that is the standard that is going to have the most effect. So what I will have people do is strip that away and say, okay, before you go into the room, I want you to, in your A, think about what is the impact I want to have? What impact do I want to have? And then we'll work backwards and we will prepare your ABC. So that's what you have. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a wallflower, great. Maybe there's a time where you just want to be an observer and you don't want to speak, Mm -hmm. but we can prepare for that. But if what you want to do is go in and you have an opinion, you have competence that you think is valuable to share, then let's think about how you set yourself up in the right way for getting into the room and being able to share that and owning your voice and doing it. But it means letting go of a mindset of comparison and it means letting go of the idea that you have to be like somebody else. Mm. That is incredible. Um, Such a great way to break it down in terms of how someone can understand how they show up and how they should show up, but do it in an authentic way that's truly right for them and the outcome that they um, wish to have. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, Let's talk about influence. Um, We're uh, living in an age of influence where your voice matters and whether you choose to express it or choose to show up or not, um, that's the dominant theme and not only the age of social media, but um, uh, just um, how we connect, collaborate with each other. And I think in a, in a strange way, the pandemic has only um, amplified that because in the only way we're really connecting with the larger community today is through technology. And, um, and yet influence is something that Uh, oftentimes women struggle with because being known or being visible um, or even a level of self-promotion is looked down upon. You know, it's, it's, um, uh, it's, it's uncomfortable. It could be considered braggadocious. How can someone 
find an authentic way to be visible and to have influence. In the virtual world as we're experiencing it today. I think we'll go back to the first question I always ask, which is what's, what's the purpose of the influence you're trying to have? So who is it you want to reach and what's the impact you want to have? And once you understand that, whether it's about promoting my brand, you know, what I do for a living and my, my job or my products or services, or whether it's about I want to reach my audience and uh, have them feel better about the situations they're in, or, you know, if I'm, I'm working with empowering other people, I want them to feel, how can I get that across to them in a, in a virtual world? So there are really three things I really have people focus on. And the first thing is you need to express empathy. Mm -hmm. Empathy virtually is tougher than showing empathy when we're physically together. Mm -hmm. Because when we're in a room together, I have the whole of my body language. I have you physically present. We can kind of feel the atmosphere that we're creating together. And you can feel whether I am really interested in what's happening for you and really understand what you want. And therefore, I'm able to serve you better because I have this tangible feeling of of warmth and connection to you through the empathy that we're mm -hmm. we're expressing to each other. So when we get onto I, camera, I when we're in show that um, through a camera. So there you go. So then, what we're left with on camera is, as you and I uh, experience, even doing this this interview, is we have just the upper part of our body typically. Mm -hmm. So we're losing a lot of information from that we are unconsciously picking up normally from people mm. as to relaxed body language or use of hands or cross legs and those things that communicate whether somebody's stressed or open mm. to what we're saying. And so what I have people do is, first of all, make sure that you look directly in the camera. And it sounds so simple, Nikki, but what I've often see people doing when they're having meetings is they have their phone in their hands and they're staring at the phone. Mm -hmm. or they're looking down at the keyboard and they may even be typing while they're listening. Mm -hmm. So the only thing the other person is seeing the top of the head. Right. Or they will be glancing at little notifications that are popping in on the screen, mails that are coming in, text messages that are coming in. And what the person who they're talking to sees is this looking away mm -hmm. regularly or looking down. And immediately it breaks the sense of trust and empathy because mm -hmm. I don't really feel I have your undivided attention. I can see you're distracted by something else. Mm -hmm. So you tell me that you want to engage with me and be here for me and build an, a trusting relationship where I'm assuming you want to have some kind of influence or impact with me, but I don't really feel there's an authentic interest mm -hmm. because what you're telling me, aside from the words, what you're telling me through your body language is that you're not really present and I'm not valuable or important enough for you to give me your undivided attention. Mm -hmm. So it's critical. Eye contact is critical. Mm -hmm. Try and talk into the camera. It's not easy because our cameras are not aligned often with the image that we're staring at, but try and make that as, as congruent as possible. Well, one uh, quick hack that really works well for that is if you're using Zoom or any kind of or Skype or something like that, make sure the window is lined up right by the camera, right by the lens. Right. So you're able to just, you know, stare in that direction because yeah. a lot of times people will have the window somewhere to the bottom left and you're staring down away from it. For <laughs> example, right? And at least if you can't do that, acknowledge it up front. Yeah. So say, you know, unfortunately my camera is to the side, so I'm looking at you, but my camera is here. So just name it, you know, mm -hmm. I, I call it serve it up, serve up the context so that people understand where you're coming from and it's not left to mystery or assumption. So eye contact is really important virtually in communication and don't be engaged in other activities while you're speaking to somebody, unless you've also served that up front and you need to let them know, mm -hmm. you know, I'm waiting on a call or I might get a mail. So if I look distracted, it's because of that, but try to clear those things away. And then the second part of communicating empathy virtually is to listen. So you can't communicate empathy while you're doing all the talking mm. because empathy is about understanding the other person's situation. Mm. So you'll need to do a lot of listening. Mm. And I would always open with a curious open question if I'm dealing with somebody over the net and let them talk so that I really understand where they are now, what's important for them. Unless the purpose of the meeting, of course, is that I need to share information, then I will say that at the, at the get-go and say, you know, the reason I'm calling is I have this information to share. Mm. But I will still open up for the other person and check that they have understood it. So empathy, the third part of empathy is check that you were actually understood or you were heard. 
So if you have shared something and you've had good eye contact and you think the message has come across, how will you know? You need to do the final part of empathic and uh, communication, which is summarize and repeat back or have them summarize and repeat back what they heard. So if you and I were having this conversation in that context, Nikki, I would say, okay, so that's what I needed to share with you. Um, I'd love to check that, you know, I've got my message across. Could, could you just tell me what you took from our conversation? What were the key takeaways for you? Excellent. And if they don't give, come back with the takeaways you hope they had, then you know your message didn't get across and you can jump back in and correct it. Mm -hmm. So, and if you want to communicate MC the other way, so the other person feels understood, you would do the same. You would say, well, thanks for sharing that, Nikki. What I took away from your message today were these three things. I hope that's in line with what you were hoping I would take away. Mm -hmm. That summary, using the same words that somebody else has used, is a great way of making sure the, per the other person feels listened to. And that's at the heart of empathy. Mm -hmm. That's powerful. Um, what, would, what guidance would you give to someone who's really struggling with um, that sense of, I don't wanna be bragging about myself um, and share information? Um, you talk about influence, right? So tell me about how someone can be more comfortable having influence and not feeling like they're simply being selfishly self-promoting. So I always say, if you want to brag, make sure that the other person has a need to hear what you're bragging about because uh -huh. otherwise it's self-serving, right? Mm -hmm. If I wander around the streets, I've written a book. If I wander around the streets telling anybody who'll listen that I've written a book, it'll be bragging because most people won't be remotely interested and it won't be serving where they are or what they need. So if you want to be self-promoting, always mm -hmm. appeal to what's in it for the other person to mm -hmm. hear your bragging. So if I'm from wanting to brag about the fact that I've written a book, I will check out that the other person is either interested in reading or in the area that I will, I'm writing about or, or it will help them solve a situation mm -hmm. that they're, they're meeting. Mm -hmm. um, so I would really talk to them about, you know, what, what is it I'm doing that can help you? Mm -hmm. Then it's not bragging, then it's helpful. So I, I kind of self-promoting is really, I have a phrase for it, I say, try and have serving others self-promoting mm -hmm. and what i mean by that is figure out what your your self-promotional gift is going to be but how it's going to help other people what's in it for them what's in it that's for them. a really good frame of reference to think about anything because if you have a gift to give through your knowledge or your expertise then it's a moral responsibility to make sure lots of people know about it so you can actually serve them because not knowing about it is not really helping anyone. Right. And bragging, if we use that terminology, is associated with somebody talking about what their gift, but in a way that it really isn't about anybody else and helping anybody else. It's about serving their own need to feel great, serving their own need to promote their competence or their skills or their grandiosity, but it's not meeting anybody else. Mm. It's in a vacuum in a way. Right. So it becomes self-promotion, helpful self-promotion is really where you're able to hook what you're doing and the gift that you have in a serving way to other people. Mm. That's beautiful. Um, I want to close out with this last question of, um, you know, thinking about the situation we're currently in, uh, in a crisis that we are, all experiencing together as uh, humanity and as tragic as the situation is, I'd love to get your perspective on the post-pandemic world. When you look into the future, what do you think will change or should change and what do you hope will stay the same? What I think will change, you know, this is really crystal ball thinking, but I'll, I'll stay on in my track and talk about the world of work, really, which I've spent a lot of time thinking about during this pandemic and how I see that that will change, is the use of technology that has enabled us to at least at some level stay connected with each other in spite of being physically distributed or unable to reach out to the people we would normally reach mm -hmm. out to. And I think the way that will change work is where remote working, flexible working, work-life balance was a challenge for companies. We've really proven that that didn't have to be. Mm -hmm. And there, there are ways of keeping 
your business moving forward and engaging your people by giving them freedoms that come with, for example, working from home or working late at night and not working all the way through the day or working around childcare commitments or other commitments that you may have. And I think it really will be something that if you have enjoyed those changes in your work environment, it wasn't something you had before, you're not going to want to give it up and go back to Mm -hmm. a a less flexible, less balanced work Mm -hmm. life. So I think the leaders of businesses where that wasn't the case are going to be really challenged to now change the working model Mm -hmm. for their employees to facilitate this ongoing kind of flexibility and balance. And I think that's absolutely for the better because the more balance we have in our lives, the healthier we are as individuals and the more businesses will thrive. Mm -hmm. So I really think that's something that's going to change. And what I hope stays the same is the compassion and the informality I've seen in businesses as I'm working now, that we don't have to be always perfect when we're in our communication as leaders to our employees. We don't have to be standing on podiums and stages presenting perfect PowerPoint presentations about strategy and, and, um, and change. We can jump on a call in our you know, sports gear from the run we've just done and talk straight into the camera and serve up just the message we need to in that moment to whoever needed to hear it. It's lowered the threshold for people feeling more relaxed and informal in their communication. And I also think it's led to a much more compassionate and empathic Mm -hmm. uh, sense of community, both in businesses and between businesses, where we're rolling up our sleeves and asking people how we can help and doing, going beyond our role, beyond our mandate, beyond our expertise to serve a community that's wider than the community we might may actually normally link to. And I really hope that stays. And I think businesses have a, a huge opportunity for contributing to keeping that change going. I think we're going to see a huge uh, transformation happen, not just at the personal level, but also the business world and the future of work is um, if we thought that was going to happen sometime in the future, well, it's happening now as we speak. Right. Culture, brands, uh, interaction, workplace, it's all transforming as we speak. So on that note, what would your parting guidance be to our audience of women professionals Um, in terms of what is the one thing, uh, maybe it's a success habit, maybe it's a principle that you personally live by and truly believe in um, that you think will help them thrive in this um, digital age and this uh, in the future of work? So I, can I share two things rather Mm -hmm. than one thing? One is visualize what success looks like for you in Mm -hmm. whichever encounter it is you're going to go into. Imagine it was successful. Imagine it happened just the way you wanted it to happen. And then work out what it is you need to do to make that happen. Mm -hmm. You might need advice, you might need help, but actually visualize it. Sports, athletes, uh, coaches working with, whether it's leaders or people in, in society, work with visualization, it's incredibly powerful. You need to know what you want to achieve and visualize it in order to get there. So do that. And the second thing I would have people do is identify any limiting beliefs that are getting in your, in your way from you getting there. So if you have a belief that you don't really deserve a voice or who do you think you are, you know, I've had some of these, Nikki, in writing a book, you know, uh, what makes you think you've got anything valuable to contribute to the world? There's all these smart people out there writing books, you know, why should you think you've got anything new to say? those limiting beliefs will stop you from reaching that visual goal. Mm -hmm. So figure out where they're coming from. They often come from somewhere else in our background, in our experience. And ask yourself, is that limiting belief still relevant to me now as an adult? Or is that something that was relevant to me earlier in life, but I don't need it anymore? I'm past that. Mm -hmm. You know, I've achieved more. I've succeeded in more ways than when I used to believe that that was true. So do I really need to carry it forward with me? Most of the time I would say no. And so you can let it go and move forward into this success picture that you're building for yourself with the belief that you can. Mm. I love that. Thank you so much. Um, Nashida, this has been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, You shared so many inspiring stories and such actionable advice that I think anyone can put into practice right away. I'm hoping that as people listen to this, they're rearranging furniture around (laughs) 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 and uh, 
you know, really thinking about how they show up and, uh, you know, um, following the ABCs that you taught. So I, I encourage everyone to uh, get a copy of your book, The Leadership Pin Code. It, uh, it's, uh, it's really uh, sound advice, especially for this day and age and exactly the challenges we're facing as individuals and as a collective humanity. So thank you so much for being on the show and uh, giving us your wisdom. Oh, it's been my pleasure. I've thoroughly enjoyed the conversation, Nikki. Thank you so much for taking the time out to have me with you today. Thanks for listening. There are thousands of podcasts out there, and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com, where you'll find show notes and links to all the resources referenced in this episode. And be sure to take the quiz on the website. Your score will tell you where you are, what helps you gain momentum, and what holds you back. You'll also get a free guide with cutting edge career strategies. We'd also love to hear from you. Share your comments and topic suggestions on IamBeyondBarriers.com and we'll be sure to address them in future episodes. If you enjoyed our show today, please subscribe and rate the podcast or just tell a friend about it. See you next episode.